And I thought my way of getting started tonight, I would tell you that uh, uh, I began working for the Lincoln Journal on October 15th, 1966. And I'd been there, I guess, about a month and was asked if I would like to be the book editor. So I said, well, sure, because I had uh, worked at university presses and, and uh, a commercial publisher, so I went ahead and took on the, on the job of book editor. But it wasn't until, and I see now that it was 1980 when I, when I came out with my first column, I somehow thought it was 1979, but uh, got a faulty memory on that one. Uh, it was 1980 uh, before I finally got up the courage to uh, start doing something that we had needed to do for a long time. We get just literally uh, hundreds of books sometimes uh, each year. I don't know that it runs hundred, a couple of hundred, maybe 300 altogether uh, of maybe 50,000 titles that are published each year. And it's just impossible to get all of the publishing news and all the reviews and everything in on uh, a single page. And there were a lot of things that I thought that uh, people who read the book page in Focus Magazine ought to know. And uh, there was no way to, to get them to them except to start writing a little column that uh, I called it at first Odds and Ends. And Dale Griffin, who was the focus editor at that time, uh, encouraged me to do this. And then, uh, so when I had done the first one, well, it wasn't long after that till I had to have my picture taken. And then we had a little signature uh, block up at the top of the page with my picture and a byline and that kind of thing. And from there, I, I started in with, uh, with just getting in uh, news about books, things like this, uh, to starting to write about Nebraska authors particularly. And uh, I have done that pretty consistently, and most of my columns anymore concern books written by Nebraskans or about Nebraska or in some way connected with this state. And uh, that's what I have been doing then since uh, oh, for a good number of years now. I thought I would start out by reading uh, the very first column I ever wrote. As I say, this one was on January 27, 1980. The publishing world is a big and bustling place, and there is no way that all of its happenings can be chronicled on the Focus book page. But maybe we can make a small dent with a column of odds and ends about books, the publishing game, authors, awards, contests, new titles, etc. The etc. is mostly what these liter literary columns will be, and you are invited to tell us what's happening that you think we ought to know about. Just drop a line to Herb Hyde, Sunday Journal and Star, P.O. Box 81689, Lincoln, Nebraska 68501. Since this is an odds and ends column, don't be too surprised at the material you find here. For example, a do Double Day News release caught my eye the other day with this opening sentence, Are you ready to die? Well, no, but if I were, I could buy a copy of Miles O'Brien Riley's Set Your House in Order, A Practical Way to Prepare for Death. It's a Doubleday paperback original to be published March 7th, and it tells you how to make things easier for those you will leave behind you when you depart this veil of tears. United Press International has reviewed a couple of books that will interest special audiences. The Illustrated Encyclopedia of World's Automobiles, edited by Davis Burgess, Wise, and the Best of Popular Photography, edited by Harvey V. Fondelier. The former should delight car buffs, and the latter ought to be do the same for camera bugs who read popular photograph photography magazine. Do invent it inventions interest you. Check out Handy Things to Have Around the House, McGraw-Hill, by Lois Russell, another UPI listing. Finally, the UPI review roundup lists four books dealing with animals, wild and domestic. Track of the Grizzly, Sierra Club, by Frank Craighead, Jr., The Wild Cats, Newsweek, by Edward R. Ricuti, Wild Animals of North America, National Geographic, and the Rand McNally Pictorial Encyclopedia of Dogs by Michael Geary. The National Geographic book, UPI says, is available only from the pu publisher, National Geographic Society, Department 100, Washington, D.C., 236. For people who want to write better, Doubleday will publish Willard R. Espy's Say It My Way on February 15th. He is an old hand at the writing game. 
I have not seen a copy of Nellie Snyder Yost's new book about Buffalo Bill, but I hope its publisher nominates it for one of the Society of the Midlands Authors Award in a biography because I am sure that it will be the definitive work on the Nebraska showman. The deadline is February 15th, and an entry fee of $10 to be paid by the publisher is required for each book. All entries must have been published in 1979. The Society defines Midland as the region between the mountain ranges including Ohio, Michigan, Indiana, Wisconsin, Illinois, Minnesota, Iowa, Missouri, North Dakota, South Dakota, Nebraska, and Kansas. A Midland author is, any, is someone who now resides in the Midland or who grew up there or who wrote this book, the one entered there. However, it is not mandatory that the author live in the Midland as long as he or she is still writing about the Midwest. The term will not apply to someone who simply attended college in the Midland or who lived there for a few years and now lives somewhere else and no longer writes published works about the Midwest. The awards will be presented in Chicago on June 3rd during a dinner at the Drake Hotel. A play can $100 will be presented to the winning authors in eight categories, fiction, poetry, history, children's books, politics, and economics, sociology and psychology, biography, and drama. Additional information is available from Jim Bowman at uh, a phone number in Chicago I get there. Nostalgia Trip, Station Identification, Confessions of a Video Kid by Donald Boy. There are some laughs in this one. Three Doubleday Self-Help Books, What Every Woman Needs to Know About the Law by Martin pa Martha Pomeroy, published January 11th, Making It as a Step Parent by Claire Berman to be published February 22nd, and Save Me by Judy Lee, due February 1st. Persons involved or interested in higher education may want to examine Theodore L. Gross's Academic Turmoil, The Reality and the Promise of Open Education, Doubleday. The article that led to it cost Gross his job at the City College of New York. Down in Oxford, Mississippi, is Yatnapatofa Press, and I have never been able to pronounce that word. It's William Faulkner's County, and it has published and is publishing all sorts of material by or about William Faulkner, his family, his works, and related subjects. The latest volume is Mississippi Poems, a facsimile edition. Scholars and, uh, and Faulkner fans will want to examine this and other items from that press as a primary sources. Likewise, admirers of Frank's James Cooper will want to read Larry Swindell's The Last Hero, a biography of Gary Cooper, which will be out February 8th. Due February 7th from Holt, Reinhardt, and Winston is Harry Mars, an oral history of the unemployed. It is easy to identify with the people in this book because, to paraphrase Pogo, they are us. So that's how I finally started it out. And it took me an un unbelievable amount of time to write that column, because I kept rewriting it, trying to get it right, trying to get uh, everything said exactly right and make it fit the space. And that's not always easy to do. Now, this will give you a little bit of background about how I came to be who I am uh, and what I do. And I've called this one a publishing quartet. If there, ever there is a scholarly publishing hall of fame, four people from the Great Plains ought to be in it from the very start. Savoy Lottenville and Mary Stith of the University of Oklahoma Press, and Bruce Nickel and the late Virginia Faulkner of the University of Nebraska Press. This quartet taught me nearly everything I know about the editing and publishing of scholarly books, but the most important thing is that they have made solid and strong the foundation for scholarly publishing on the plains. I was reminded of their contributions most recently by the Prairie Schooni Schooner double number dedicated to University of Nebraska English professor Bernice Sloat, but the fall 1981 catalogs of the two presses offer splendid examples of their value to the people who dwell in this nation's north-south midsection from Canada to Mexico. More about this later. First, let me pay my personal tributes. Running University Press is no small job because at the outset a director must accept the re reality that the operation is nonprofit and exists to fulfill the first nine words of subsection eight, article eight, or subsection eight, art, uh, section eight of article one of the U.S. Constitution to promote the progress in science and useful arts. 
Lottenville and Nickel succeeded admirably in carrying out this responsibility, particularly in serving the people of the Great Plains and preserving the heritage of the Trans-Mississippi and Trans-Missouri West. In fact, I see their presses as the anchors of scholarly publishing on the Plains. There are, of course, other university presses and scholarly publishing activities in the Plains states and their neighbors, Kansas, Missouri, Iowa, and they issue many, many valuable works. But Oklahoma and Nebraska have been the pioneers on this frontier. Blazing the trail down south was a Rhodes Scholar, Westerner, and journalist with a vast appreciation for all the arts. And from him, I learned the value of interdisciplinary scholarship. Publishing books on art, music, and literature, for example, was as natural to Lottonville as publishing books about the Great Plains, Native Americans, and development of the West. In broad terms, the former served the world at large, the latter the regional parish. Quality was the hallmark. For him, books had to be as nearly perfect as humanly possible in editorial content, illustrative material, design, printing, binding, and jacketing. And there was always room for improvement. The Northern Trailblazer was just as insistent on craftsmanship. Nichol, too, was a journalist, and like Lottonville, a Westerner. The Scotsman lived up to his stereotype and financial shrewdness by making a successful business venture out of a struggling operation. His stroke of genius was a line of paperbacks that he could christened bison books. Not only did they put UNP on sound footing, they have burgeoned into one of the most successful soft cover lines in scholarly publishing. The hardback line is just as impressive because of Nichols' early work in securing sound manuscripts, the publication of which would serve both the nation and the plains. Essential to any university press is a good editor, and Oklahoma and Nebraska have been blessed with two of the finest. If there is any one thing for which Miss Stith should be noted, it is style. She not only put it in the proper perspective, but made it simple as possible for copy editors who had to deal with the complex, difficult to understand subjects. It is no surprise that she was consulted during the preparation and su supplied material for the 12th edition of the University of Chicago Press Manual of Style, the standard un for university presses and other scholarly, scholarly publishers, but widely used elsewhere. Miss Sith's counterpart at UNP was a writer first, then an editor, so the pers perspective was different. From Miss Faulkner, I learned more of the nuances of writing, but she was no less a stickler for accuracy and competent scholarship than Miss Stith. Furthermore, she was a walking library of the kind of information an editor needs, especially concerning Nebraska and Nebraska authors. Her computer-like memory bank permitted her to quote page number and line on just about any source of material I ever asked her about. Thanks to her skill and guidance, UNP's reader can enjoy some of the world's finest writing and literary criticism. I have nearly filled my allotted space. To paraphrase John Paul Jones, I have not yet become to write. No, not only have I fallen short in paying tribute to the four notable scholars, I have touched only briefly on how their work has served the people of the Great Plains. More about that next week. And then the very next week, I wrote a column called Anchors on the Plains. Last week in this spate, I, uh, st space, I wrote of four outstanding persons in scholarly publishing, Savoy Lawton with Savoy Lottenville and Mary Stith of the University of Oklahoma Press, and Bruce Nickel and the late Virginia Faulkner of the University of Nebraska Press. And I described their presses as anchors of scholarly publishing on the plains. Helping to make this so are four other persons, two on each staff, who are products of a program launched in 1947, the University of Oklahoma Press Fellowships. UOP fellows, there are two each year, are given a stipend and spend 12 months in very in intensive on-the-job training. Near the end of their stint, UOP announces their availability in letters to the publishing trade. As far as I know, no fellow ever has failed to land a job. In fact, those who are still active are directing university prices or holding ancillary positions in scholarly publishing, serving in various capacities in commercial and other publishing, and at least one instance writing columns about books and occasionally editing scholarly and commercial manuscripts. Getting down to brass tacks. Last week, I said the reali first reality a university press director must ex accept is the fact that his operation will be nonprofit and will exist to fulfill an obligation found in subsection 8, artic uh, section 8, article 1 of the U.S. Constitution, and I won't read that again. For example, how many people can one expect to be interested in an atlas of the distribution of freshwater fish families of the world by Tim M. Barra, UNP, or the pottery of 
application by Leona M. Lackey from the University of Oklahoma Press. Yet these books are invaluable to the biologists, ethnologists, and other folks who want or need to use them in the field. And certainly both volumes promote the progress of science and the useful arts. Moreover, in the long run, we all may benefit from the work of scholars who read them and use them as research tools. It takes money to print such books, and a director's big hope is to sell enough copies to break even. After that, sales proceeds can be used to publish other deserving works. Lottenville and Nickel were masters of this process, and two books will serve as examples of their skill. Plowman's Folly by E.H. Faulkner from Oklahoma and The Populist Revolt by John D. Hicks from Nebraska. The former deals with agriculture of the Great Plains, the latter with its people. Thousands of copies of both volumes have been sold. Both are in print today, and this was way back in 1981. Because of them and other books that have enjoyed exceptional sales success, the university presses were and are able to finance publication of limited market books like the two mentioned earlier. These books from University of Oklahoma Press and University of Nebraska Press fall catalogs will give you some idea of how the two university presses are uh, serving their Great Plains Parish. First, Oklahoma. Oklahoma Memories, edited by Ann Hodges Morgan and Renard Strickland. Custom Combining on the Great Plains by Thomas D. Eisen. Oklahoma, A History of Five Centuries, second edition, by Earl Mor Morgan Gibson. Professors, Presidents, and Politicians, Civil Rights in the University of Oklahoma, 1890 to 1968, by George Lynn Cross. Slim Buttes, 1876, an episode of the Great Sioux War, by Jerome A. Green. The Red River in Southwestern History, by Carl Newton Tyson. Grass and Grasslands, Systematics and Ecology, edited by James R. Estes, Ronald J. Turrell, and Jer R. N. Brunken. And from Nebraska, The Modern Cowboy by John R. Erickson. Mister, you got yourself a horse. Tales of Old Time Horse Trading, edited by Roger L. Welch. Cleo's Cowboys, Studies in the Historiography of the Cattle Trade by Don D. Walker. Indian Policy of the United States, Historical Essays by Francis Paul Prucha. The Great Plains, Perspective and Prospects, edited by Merlin P. Lawson and Maurice E. Baker. Family Strengths, Three, Roots and Well-Being, edited by Nick Stinnett, John Dufresne, Kay King, Patricia Knaub, and George Rowe. Some titles, especially in the last time UNP offering, may seem too broad in scope to classify as parochial publications, yet their primary audience lives in the Great Plains. Conversely, if I have not listed books that were written for a very limited non-Plains audience or for a very wide and general one that automatically would include Plains residents. Instead, my purpose has been to show how well U University of Oklahoma Press and the University of Nebraska Press are serving the people of the Great Plains. I I'd say they're doing all right, wouldn't you? And they're doing all right today. Uh, Nebraska, I think, uh, we have to be very proud of uh, Bill Regier and that press out there. They are, are one of the very first-rate presses, not only in this country, but around the world. And you can't believe the number of books that you will find from University of Nebraska Press if you go to Montana or Washington State or California or Utah or New York or some of these other places. And you start looking in museums and the book rack, and lo and behold, you will find something from the University of Nebraska Press. This one I wrote one time when uh, I think the library was at that time having a uh, an emphasis on reading and children, especially reading to your children. And so I uh, wrote this column about that. The boy put on his coat, stocking cap, and the scratchy wool scarf in the cloakroom, went to his desk, pulled a book from it, and started to read. He had been reading for several minutes when the coolness of a hand on his forehead startled him into the present from his incredibly suspenseful adventure on the forest wilderness frontier of 19th century America. You're burning up with fever, child. What are you doing in school, the teacher asked. I don't feel bad, and I just had to finish this book so I could find out what happened, the boy replied. Does your mother know you're sick? Well, no, ma'am, I don't think so. I told her I felt okay, and I really do, ma'am, really. 
Naturally, the teacher, teacher didn't believe him when he said he felt fine because his flushed face and the dullness of his eyes, not to mention his high fever, gave him away. She called his mother and sent him home with a big grocery sack full of books to read until he was well enough to come back to school. That's how much I liked to read when I was in the fourth grade. Even though I was so sick, I could scarcely hold my head up. I wasn't about to miss out on that story of a kid who lived in the woods and was trapped miles from home in a blizzard. Most of the books I read in fourth grade were quality books, and it was quality it was the name of Hoban's suggest today in children's literature. Russell and Million Hoban are the old hands of the game and are likely to be winners until they retire. It was my pleasure recently to attend a breakfast for Lillian Hoban at Nebraska Center. She gave only a short talk, but one of the statements she made was significant to me. The golden age of publishing, specifically in children's literature, is over, she said. Amen. I have felt that way for years. There is hope, though, and publishing can have another golden age if two top-notch if top-notch authors and illustrators like her and her husband and their children keep showing up and doing their thing. I have read Lillian's and Russell's work, and it is excellent. She has illustrated more books, many of them Russell's, than she has written, but the end result is well worth the effort she puts into it. Her animals are the kind you love immediately. Her children look precisely the way children ought to look in a given circumstances. I figure that she must do plenty of revising to get things just right. Otherwise, her work wouldn't be so pleasing. From the day I learned to read, I have found a whole other world in books. The problem now is that I never have enough time to read as much as I would like. Ah, there is the catch, however. If a book doesn't fulfill my expectations reasonably early, I waste no time on it. Quality, excellence, if you will, must be my benchmark, and I would suggest that it should be a benchmark in children's literature, too. You will find it in books by the Hobans and by other well-known children's authors. Have you seen the prices on books lately, you may say? Well, yes, I have, and they are outrageously high, but then so is everything else. Besides, books need to be rapidly consumable. They can be read for a life, need not be rapidly consumable. They can be read for a lifetime if they are cared for. There is something else to consider, too. You and your children can read quality books free at your public library, or at home if you check them out at the desk, or or at school, or at home if you check them out from the school. No one need be without a book, especially in Lincoln, where the library system is superb. There is especially, this is especially true of the Young People's Division, which is, which is Virginia Opasensky's bailiwick. And of course, she's gone now. And Vicki Wood is here. You will find none better at the job than she is. All of which brings me to this. Urge your children to read. Guide them. Read with them. For not only is much of the wisdom of the ages to be found in books, but there is in them a limitless universe of adventure, entertainment, and pure enjoyment. Reading is a wonderful way to get away from television, and you can have gobs of fun at it. Another point. How much easier it is to read, say, Thoreau, Faulkner, Eliot, Emerson, Poe, or even Schultz Schopenhauer in adult life if you have been reading since you were a child. There is always a payoff, a bottom line, and mine is this. You can get a whale of an education just by reading. Abe, Abe Lincoln got a bunch of his exactly that way. And then I picked out uh, some columns that I wrote for people who had uh, had died. Death comes for all, us all, of course, be we archbishops or common folk. But its sudden appearance in our midst shocks, bewilders, brings pain. Virginia Faulkner knew it would come for her one day, but before it did, she filled her life with a vintage scholarship that will not be forgotten. Accuracy was a matter of necessity to her. Dates had to be right. Names had to be spelled correctly. Check the chronology. Don't use this or that source because, it's, because it is suspect. Writing should move, she said. Make the reader feel something. When you edit, make it do that. That's the sort of taskmaster she was, and it made her one of the finest editors in the world. I will remember her most, though, for her memory bank of knowledge that could be dispensed instantly. She could tell you not only where you would find something, but whether it was worth your time to look it up. And in many cases, she could give you the page number. 
No one, I suspect, can organize material as efficiently as she did. Taking a fact here and there and putting it in, putting it in the right place, eliminating repetition, arranging things in a proper order that was not necessarily chronological, sparring with sentences and paragraphs and pages until she had punched them into such a form that their author would know immediately that this is what he or she had meant to say all along. I wonder sometimes if there was anything about Willa Cather or Mari Sandals that she did not know. I wonder too how she is able to, was able to keep it all straight, especially the intricate details of these women's lives, not to mention the deep probing analyses of their work. No matter, she did it and scholarship is the better for it. And then I wrote uh, about Bernice Sloat in a column that uh, really dwelt on the double, the double issue number that the Prairie Schooner put out for. A very beautiful edition. I think I'm going to skip that to get down to uh, what I had written about her at her death. It is possible for if it is possible for one person to walk in the shadow or be in the shade of another, Bernice Sloat did so with Willa Cather. I am powerless to explain further than to say that when I read Sloat material on Cather, it is as if I am reading Cather herself. Nor can I believe that anyone else will come as close to explaining Willa Cather in her art as did Bernice Sloat. Thus death has deprived the world of a very unique interpreter. During the 18 years I knew her, Miss Sloat was a well of information from which I could draw at any time and often did. Was there anything I wondered about John Keats or Willa Cather that she did not know? If so, one might never detect it because she always seemed to be able to provide what the questioner wanted. I envy her students because in her classes they received the best literary education anyone could hope for. She was a teacher's teacher, I'm told, a lecturer who could make fascinating the dullest material. Would I would that I had taken some of my college coursework under her gifted tutelage. Just as much of what I know about Willa Cather's life, particularly in Red Cloud, comes from Mildred Bennett. So too does much of what I know about Willa Cather's art come from Bernice Sloat. There are many other Cather scholars, of course, and they are scattered throughout the world. But Mildred Bennett and Bernice Sloat and the late Virginia Faulkner, who was Miss Sloat's editor at the University of Nebraska Press, must be classified as Cather scholars with a capital S. Their work is closest to the primary materials that are the foundations of solid scholarship. And succeeding generations of students will in turn turn to it in the quest for knowledge. That's as it, as it should be. It is amazing to me that Bernice Sloat turned up in so many places. One expected to see her at the annual Cather Conference at Red Cloud, but she was active elsewhere, too. She was at Union College when Mildred Bennett was honored, at Bennett Martin Library during the Lord and Isley celebration, at various literary and social functions. I was surprised that she found time to attend many, e many events while teaching, writing, and conducting research hither and yon. I suppose it was her nature, and the essence of which seems to be curiosity, that she should be where, as popular idiom has it, the action was. She wore honor with the humility and grace of the vibrant person she was, and surely honor came her way, deservedly, over the years. The tone of her velvet soft voice bore the expectancy of something worthwhile to be heard, and her words fulfilled the promise. Who could meet her and not be drawn to her intellect and charm and wit? Certainly not I, for I'm sure could many people who had the opportunity to know her. Only this planet's physical bounds could contain the respect, the admiration, the esteem, the love that people held for her. International boundaries did not. That too is as it should be. I must confess that I have read, read all too little of Bernice Sloat's poetry, and that is not as it should be. Quality is worth something, however, and I am the richer for my perusal of her poems. It is her prose that has drawn my attention over the years, particularly The Kingdom of Art, Willa Cather's First Principles and Critical, critical Statements, 1893-1896. A reading of this volume is essential if one is to understand Willa Cather to any degree, because in it are the many foundation stones on which Cather's work rests. Miss Sloat has carefully identified for them, us, for, uh, them for us, explaining their importance without disturbing the mortar in which they rest. Could anyone ask for more? 
one issue of Prairie Schooner that I will always treasure is the spring-summer 1981 double number dedicated to Bernice Sloat. Editor Hugh Luke divided it into three marvelous portfolios that are to be savored again and again. Bernice Sloat, a phot photographic essay. A selection of writings by Bernice Sloat and a checklist of her published works compiled by Tom Pagaga. An essay is written in celebration of Bernice Sloat. This will suffice until a Sloat biography appears, but there must be a biography and it must be done by someone with the requisite ability and set sensitivity to cope with genius. Portfolio one, you may recall, consisted of Cather Country fo uh, photographs by Lucia Woods. Portfolio two, I wrote, affords a glimpse of the creative, creative process through which Sloat, uh, Miss Sloat shows us not only her world and ours, but those of other artists. The title of Portfolio 3 is self-explanatory. I noted that the special issue in my August 2nd column and tried to write my own appreciation of Miss Sloat, but all I could muster were two disparate images of her as a writer and an artist. I can do no better today. Now, as then, I rely on the first two paragraphs of a letter to Miss Sloat from Governor Charles Thone. Now, as then, his words tell us why we should celebrate Bernice Sloat. In the comparative stillness of life on the plains, creative genius reaches out of the wind and touches the minds and souls of those who listen to its song, the heartbeat of the soil and the voices of the past and present, their agonies and hardship, their joys and plenty. The open fields magnify the reality of the burning sun of life at midday and gloriously reflect in sunset the wonders of infinity. Distinguished daughter of the plains, you have listened to the wind and flourished in the sunlight, bearing enduring and celebrated fruit which enhances the literature of the world. Versatile scholar, distinguished teacher, editor, poet, and writer of national and international acclaim, I salute you on behalf of all Nebraskans. You were right, Governor. Bernice Sloat truly was a daughter of the Plains, and that is the way I will remember her. And then there was uh, a man who taught English at the University of Nebraska, Brent Bulkey. And he was also an Episcopal priest. And on Cather days, he would hold the service, usually at 8.30, at uh, Grace Episcopal Church there in Red Cloud. That was uh, Miss Cather's church, and she gave uh, stained glass windows of her, of her parents to honor, honor her parents. Beautiful windows. Anyway, uh, Brent, unbeknownst to me, uh, had cancer, and I didn't know until he died that he had it. Not often is this, in this world does a man of great stature pass our way, and when one does, we sometimes fail to appreciate his presence fully until he is no longer among, a, among us. So it is, perhaps, with L. Brent Bulkey, whom I knew as a friend and admired as a scholar of the old school for whom the epitome of excellence is the only standard. Would that I had known he would be called home so soon and unexpectedly. Brent was a man of two worlds, suffering, serving as a chaplain and active vicar at St. Mark's on the campus of Episcopal Church and teaching in the English department at the University of, Bra of Nebraska-Lincoln, where he earned his well-deserved Ph.D. For several years on the first Saturday in May at Grace Episcopal Church in Red Cloud, it was easy for church corps to see that he was comfortably at home in in both worlds as he conducted mass and delivered a scholarly homily on Grace Church's history or Willa Cather or some aspect of her work. It was a thing to look forward to. There was another Brent too, loving husband to Bev and father to Sarah and Susanna, counselor to students and others who needed spiritual nourishment, and friend and mentor to people who shared his fields of interest. That he fulfilled filled these demanding roles so well is in itself a tribute to him and the love one has always felt in his presence. It is altogether fitting then that the next Sunday at St. Mark's will dedicate its obedient pipe organ to Brent and honor his memory with a dinner at Wick Alumni Center. The 3 p.m. dedication will feature a recital by organist Craig J. Kramer of Notre Dame University, followed by a high tea in the church lounge and courtyard, during which guests will be treated to music by a strolling violinist. Brent would have loved this part of the day, I'm sure, because he played a mean guitar, especially in the folk mass. Tickets to the afternoon events, which primarily recall Brent's service as a clergyman, are $10 each. 
The prime rib dinner at WIC will serve as the vehicle to commemorate Brent's life as a scholar. Several people who knew him and worked with him will speak, noting in particular his accomplishments as a scather scholar, which reached tangible fruition with the posthumous publication of Willa Cather in person, interviews, speeches, and letters by the University of Nebraska Press. Tickets for the prime rib dinner are $13 each and are available as are the dedication tickets at St. Mark's on the campus. Meanwhile, between now and Sunday, on Thursday to be precise, you can attend two readings, both free, at uh, 3.30 p.m. in room 228 of UNL's Andrews Hall. You can hear poet and translator Stuart Freebert. And then uh, I don't think I'll read the rest of this one. I think I've, the one, part I wanted you to hear was, was what I had written about Brent Bulky. I have been really fortunate in knowing some very excellent writers and scholars since I've been in Nebraska, and I have met a, a ton of them over the years since I've been here. I moved here in 1965, and uh, I'm still meeting people I haven't, uh, haven't heard of but have been writing for years. Uh, this next one. This man was, uh, was one of my absolute very best friends, and I think you'll see why. Death is a part of living, but somehow I never prepared, I'm never prepared for the news of it when it happens, even less so when that news is unexpected. So it was a few months ago when I learned of, Ka of Cather scholar Brent Bulky's death, and so it was again Tuesday when I learned that Richard L. Lane of Omaha, immediate past president of the Nebraska Writers Guild and its former treasurer of many terms, had died. I could not have been more shocked had my Omaha caller told me the world had ended and we missed it. Dick was a man for all reasons, you always felt special in his presence, and his presence always overflowed its space. You might be a stranger to him once, but twice, never. The second time, he not only called you by name, but could recite your bio. That's when you knew you were in the presence of greatness. As his wife Carolyn observed, he marched to his own drummer. Although you never quite knew how he was going to go about it, you knew he would succeed and have fun doing so. Perhaps it was because Dick had the knack of dissecting a complex situation to its skeleton and putting it back together in simple form, but regardless of what it was, he could put you at ease with a problem and show you at least one way to solve it. He once told me when I had said yes too many times, you've got too much on your plate. And on more than one occasion during our joint tenure in Writers Guild, he took some of my serving for his own. Dick was teaching English at Omaha University four years before it game became the University of Nebraska at Omaha. He was acting dean and then associate dean of UNO's College of Arts and Sciences. And it was he who set up UNO's Afghanistan Studies program. All that was frosting on the cake, though. At heart, he was a writer, a master wordsmith who not only wrote accurately but entertainingly as well. One of the most enjoyable tasks of my life was to prepare for publication a University of Oklahoma Press book, which Dick edited and annotated, and for which he supplied a sparkling introduction, Midnight and Dune Day, or The Incidental History of Southern Kansas and the Indian Territory, 1871-1890, by G.D. Freeman. It was and re remains the only manuscript I have ed ever edited with a certain knowledge that everything in it was accurate, and the only thing I'd have to do would be to style it and look for typographical errors. As writer, Dick had a great way of understanding monumental situations in such a way that, uh, that readers were left holding their sides lest they burst with laughter. Yet he could be serious, too, for he was a perfectionist and demanded as much of his students, though he knew their limits as well as his own, and tolerated these. Maybe it was this combination of talents that caused his writing to flow so smoothly and beautifully with crisp details and moving description, his natural wit brightening the whole appropriately here and there. Whatever it was, it cannot be duplicated, not ever. The mold is broken. And Dick was... Uh, Dick was president after, after I was. Uh, he came in in 1986, and then he died in uh, 1987. September 20th, it was, I think, around the 14th. 
but uh, I never saw anyone who had as much fun teaching college students and writing as he did. I've got some of his stuff at home and, and just a, a kind of thing he put together for the family and it is hilarious. I just literally roll off my chair every time I read that thing. And it's about a trip he took, a research trip down into, through Kansas and Oklahoma and Texas uh, to get material for a book. And it is absolutely funny. And finally, when former resident, Lincoln resident Tor Dorothy Thomas spoke at the Lauren Isley celebration dinner in Elephant Hall in September 1984, I marveled at the way she could put in the simple telling of an anecdote into a beautiful poetic form. She spoke of the University of Nebraska campus at Eventide, describing mauve shadows and golden squares of light from windows illuminating softly falling snow. She remembered the crispness of the evening, the calm air and the sounds wafting through it, the cool feel of the crystalline flakes as they touched her cheeks. All this and more in telling about her acquaintance with Lauren Isley and Mabel Langdon, who was to be his wife. Dorothy was one of the very few people at their wedding. I first read Dorothy's short stories when I was in college during the mid-1950s and took a writing course under Melvin Vandenbark, who had taught at NU and had several students there who later became distinguished writers, among them Mari Sandos. Dorothy knew all of these people and many other notables, such as Mabel Dodge Luhan, and eventually became as fine a storyteller as Van was. Her way with words is to be envied by those who would write. During the six years since her Lincoln visit, Dorothy and I corresponded and visited by telephone. Each time she was hard at work revising a story, as is in the case with all good writers, revision is a way of life. Or doing a talking book for the blind, or taking care of her husband, John Burt Bickerud, at their home in Bronte, Texas. A great name for an author's town, that. A stroke failed to slow her memory down, slow her down much, nor did it affect her memory for details. She recalled names, places, events with unequal clarity and ease. Even John's death failed to daunt her for long. The last time I spoke with her, Dorothy was looking forward to celebrating her 92nd birthday in August. She did just that. She laughed at the passage of time, delighted in it, in fact. But there was one enemy she could not defeat, cancer. After a long and agonizing round of suffering, she finally surrendered on September 22nd. And she was a good storyteller. And, and uh, you'll find her works, uh, The Home Place, still in print, I think, at the University of Nebraska Press. Uh, Maud Jeter's Girls, which is the last uh, paperback edition of which she put out uh, had uh, some of her own original drawings and artwork in it. She was an artist also, and her sister was an artist too, Kenitha. They all lived here in Lincoln, up in uh, Bethany as a matter of fact. And uh, that's where George Mick Sutton, a famous ornithologist, also lived. And he was John Janovey's teacher at the University of Oklahoma. And there's a long story about that. Extensive column back in uh, 1987 called, uh, and I headed, headlined it, Twilight of the Sioux, No, a Brightening Dawn. Only a few white petals from the flowering crabs were scattered about the John G. Neihart Center grounds April 25th, but the tree of life in the center of the Sioux Prayer Garden was in nearly full bloom, and a mockingbird was providing continuous music from the top of a very tall tree just beyond the late poet laureate's study. Mix these things with a cool breeze, a warm sun, and 90 e people eager to hear three outstanding speakers, and you've got Spring Conference Day, 1987. I could listen to Albert Whitehat Sr. of Rosebud, South Dakota, 24 hours a day and not tire of his voice, I think. Undoubtedly, this child of the late, dirty 30s must come very close to speaking as his grandfathers did in the old days. Several of his listeners remarked on his eloquence, which I caught early on. Within moments after he began to speak, I found myself listening intently, the better not to miss a word. I had no idea that time could pass so swiftly. White Hat told us the story of his life, and yet when we heard was what we heard was a mini history of the Sioux Nation. He recounted personal experiences, yet we knew he was speaking of and for multitudes. Most important, however, he spoke in a way that gave each word the force of many and assigned each inflection an emotional role. Perhaps, I reasoned, he derived such power from Lakota, and I would presume the same could be said of certain other uh, Indian dialects, because it, because it is still basically a spoken language rather than a written one. Whatever the case, White Hat audi audience appreciated his delivery enough to give him a standing ovation when he finished. This man found no poverty in his mother's 
16 by 20 foot tent as he grew up. She refused to live with her older children, preferring the old ways. His family following the harvest as migrant workers and he attending the school in the fall. He found love and warmth in that home, learned to cherish the, da cherish the dance until he was 12 and was thrilled by the stories the elders told. He learned to love music at an early stage and drew strength from it as it played through his mind at lonely moments. Although he graduated from high school, a boarding school at 20, the young Albert educated himself in many ways, particularly in the comforting setting of nature, Earth Mother, as he worked for farmers and ranchers and cared for their livestock, knowing, he said, that in his employer's eyes the animals were far more valuable than he. Although he had known and spoken Lakota, peer pressure from both whites and his own people forced him to abandon it. To exist in white society at that time, he said, he had to deny his Lakota heritage. Not until he had gone to Dallas to technical school in an isolation that devastated him, not until he had turned to alcohol and drugs and learned that they helped no answers, not until he had read John G. Nyhart's Black Elk Speaks, not until he had plumbed the depths of depression all the way to the bottom, did he wake up one morning and know in his heart that it is all right to be an Indian. Both the Sioux Nation and the world are fortunate that Albert Whitehat found himself. For today, he directs the bilingual teacher training program at Sintaglashka College in Rosebud, South Dakota, and teaches Lakota medicine and language. He has not been the Hollywood version of Indianness. He has has no vision on his own vision, had no vision on his own vision quest, but he has seen the spirits work in people around him. He burned his mouth and throat terribly in his first sweat lodge until he learned how to proceed through it the steam and heat inhaling cleansing ceremony. The sun dance was not a major problem because he had learned much and had prepared himself for it. So for him, each dance has meant a spiritual cleansing, a fulfilling sense of peace in physical and mental well-being. White Hat told us much more about his people and their culture, but space precludes its inclusion here. He gave us two things that I would ha leave with you, however. One of them is love for one another. This means we love and care for family, friends, the unfortunate, the elderly, the helpless, all the brothers and sisters with whom we share Earth Mother. And we always put them first, never ourselves. The other thought is that each of us owns just one thing in this world, a body. And if it becomes necessary in the course of loving and caring for others, we gladly offer it for them. And this guy was really, truly a very fine speaker. And he had that, that grace and that eloquence that all Indian speakers uh, seem to have uh, when they, you know, when they are taught, they, they can speak English and, and talking very seriously. And if you remember Chief Joseph's words, the Naperse chief, uh, where, where he says uh, that he won't fight no more forever. Uh, that was a very eloquent speech too. I don't think you're going to find, find any more eloquent than some of, the, some of our Indian uh, people have made. And then I wanted to, I wanted to read you uh, a piece that I had. Uh, I did lots of nice heart uh, columns and things too that I'm skipping over because we're running out of time here. But I wanted to read you a piece that I uh, got in trouble with with my editors because they were pretty sensitive uh, about this. Uh, they wanted to revise it, and I said, well, it's either going to be the way I write it or it's not going to be written. Every year at this time, the nuclear bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki is, is commemorated. And at the time the event has run its course, many Americans almost seem to believe that the United States started World War II in the Pacific with a sneak attack on Tokyo. As an antidote to such feelings of guilt, I offer two books that help to dispel the idea that our country was and is the world's eternal villain because it dropped those two A-bombs. Manny Lawton's Some Survived, Al Conquin Books of Chapel Hill, North Carolina, and General Wainwright's Story by Bannon Books, edited by Robert Considine. I also call your attention to the picture on this page, which to me amply demonstrates that during World War II, the Nazis had nothing on the Japanese as far as inhumanity was concerned. And I show a picture here of some people. I don't know whether you can see it all that well from here, but these would be uh, mistaken for uh, prisoners at Dachau or any of the Nazi concentration camps. These were uh, American prisoners of war. 
helped by the Japanese. Let's start with Lawton's book. He participated in the Bataan Death March, that little walk the Japanese organized for captured Americans and Filipinos. There were 70,000 participants when it began, but only 54,000 when it ended. The Japanese treated Lawton to still another adventure, an all-expense-paid visit to Japan aboard an overloaded ship. 1,600 prisoners of war got on, but fewer than 400 got off. Lawton and his buddies landed in northern Kyushu, but were in a Korean prison camp when the war ended. His weight had dropped to 115 pounds from a strapping 185, and he had been tortured and otherwise abused by his captors. He had survived against incredible odds. Skinny Wainwright makes clear in his account of the Philippines War and his captivity with the Japanese, uh, in his captivity, that the Japanese ignored the Geneva Convention and human de decency. Officers, including himself, were beaten, kicked, and mistreated to the point where many died, without proper medical care, of course, because, Wainwright says, the Japanese would neither provide it nor allow captured physicians to administer it. Nor does Wainwright mince words in revealing his fear of what would happen to American civilians, especially nurses, in the hands of Japanese troops. They, too, were mistreated, the women raped repeatedly, and the men and children used for bayonet practice or other forms of amusement. Skinny, he was a living model of his nickname at war's end, takes in the whole gamut of moral depravity that the Japanese military trademark was the Japanese military trademark during World War II. The general was in Manchuria when the war ended and was liberated by the Russians. That in itself was an experience, but his adventures in trying to get out of Manchuria or something else again. It was extremely frustrating, but by hook and crook, he was finally able to make enough connection to get to the USS Missouri for the surrender ceremony. There are enough horror stories in these two books to last a lifetime, and one would think that American POWs would feel an overpowering desire to kill their captors when they got the chance. Such was not the case. When they were told they were free, both Lawton and Wainwright felt pity for their tormentors, as did most of the American prisoners of war. They forgave the enemy. As Wainwright says, after citing U.S. intelligence reports and projections, it is a near certainty that hundreds of thousands, perhaps millions, of American lives would have been lost had the United States not used those two terrible weapons to bring Japan to her knees and avoid the necessity of invading the home islands. It was on the basis of this horrendous potential and its consequences that Harry Truman decided to use the bomb in 1945. It is regrettable that the United States found it impossible to avoid using it, but the awful decision had to be made in Truman made it. I submit that he made the right move and that considering the circumstances, the United States has no reason to apologize for it. World War II is 41 years behind us now. Instead of continuing to dwell on it, we should put it in proper perspective and have it in the past. I am not suggesting that it be forgotten, but at this point, all we need to say really is that Japan, Germany, and Italy started it, and the United States, Britain, and their allies finished it. Let's leave it at that. That one, as I say, uh, I had a little bit of trouble with. And then finally, I think I want to leave you with this one. We're about out of time here. To say it is difficult for me to write a meaningful column in the aftermath of the Challenger tragedy is an understatement of the first magnitude. I did not see the explosion at first hand, but when its terrible reality in the te television replay finally sank into my consciousness, I wept. Nor has the image vanished from my mind. Perhaps it never will. After all, how does one witness the death of seven human beings without feeling the deep, stabbing pain of loss? How does one describe one's awe of a power so enormous that it consumes several, seven lives in milliseconds? I have not the talent or the words. There is catharsis in talk, someone has said, and it's true. A friend and I were discussing Tuesday's events, and he said he could think of no better way to die than to be taken instantly while doing the thing he loved most, flying. I have a nephew, an Air Force fighter pilot, who shares that philosophy. He would fly 24 hours a day forever if that were possible. What makes these men feel this way? Is it the same soul-saturating desire for adventure that sent those five men and two women into space aboard Challenger? It is a desire born by the genes of humankind, for every generation has its quota of courageous travelers to unknown frontiers. It is they who have made the civilization, our civilization, what it is today. To illustrate the point in familiar terms, if there had been no pioneers, there would be no Nebraska. 
My friend made an interesting comment about the space program when he said, will NASA send a poet or some other kind of writer along on a space flight? He suggested a couple of names, and I mentioned a few, and we speculated on, speculated on what kind of breathtaking material we would get from them. Then I asked him if he had ever read a poem titled High Flight, written by a young Royal Canadian Air Force pilot during World War II. I quoted a couple of fragments. He had a copy, and I would wager against all odds that my nephew has had these lines memorized for years. The poem has come about, uh, has co had come to mind about noon Tuesday when I heard someone in television try to explain why so many in w men and women are eager to participate in the space program, even at the risk of losing their lives. The reason is the thrill of it all, I thought. Later in the day, the House Majority Leader recited the poem in full, and President Reagan used it, used phrases from it in his address to the nations. The sonnet was written by John Gillespie McGee, Jr., 19, an American volunteer in the Royal Canadian Air Force who was killed in action on December 11th, 1941. And here it is. Oh, I have slipped the surly bonds of earth and danced the skies on laughter-silvered wings. Sunward I have climbed and joined the tumbling mirth of sun-split clouds and done a hundred things you have not dreamed of. Wheeled and soared and swung high in the sunlit silence. Hovering there, I've chased the shouting wind along and flung my eager craft through fo footless halls of air. Up, up the long, delirious, burning blue, I've topped the windswept heights with easy grace whenever lark or even eagle flew. And while with silent lifting mine I've trod the high, untrespassed sanctity of space, put out my hand and touch the face of God. Thank you.